Today we're going to close out metabolism, our multi-class journey on metabolic pathways by bringing the different catabolic and anabolic paths that we've introduced so far in the setting of diets and obesity, alcohol consumption and metabolism, as well as oxidative stress. And we'll do this introduction through diets over the ages. The first one that we will start off with a couple of decades ago is the low-fat diet. So, oh, if an individual wants to re reduce their BMI, reduce their adiposity, reduce their fat stores, it seemed like it would make sense to reduce fat intake, eliminate fat intake, and then maybe so then gain fat. However, from the pathways that we've talked about the last couple of classes, one can see how if there's an excess of the building blocks for triglycerides, the circulating fatty acids with that carbon backbone, all of these pathways can run in reverse for fat storage instead of fat breakdown. If the fat intake is substituted with an equal amount of carbon sources, all right, caloric intake through complex carbohydrates that get broken down into simple sugars or simple carbohydrates, glucose, sucrose, etc. That's all you need to make fat. Why? Well, the glycerol backbone for triglycerides can be bypassed out from glyceraldehyde free phosphate via the metabolic breakdown pathway that I talked about at the end of last class. And if there's an excess of pyruvate and then by extension acetyl-CoA backed up uh, at, at the entry point into the TCA cycle, rather than getting broken down through that beta oxidation path pathway, the cells can build up fat through fatty acid synthesis to build, bring these together in the form of triglycerides and now you have high circulating free fatty acids that will get stored by adipocytes in the body. Right, so if the no-fat diet is a, is a no-go, uh, what else can you do? How about the no-nothing diet? <laughs> or just starve yourself. This will work, right? Because you haven't put any calories, any carbon sources uh, for the cells to be able to, uh, to metabolize. Um, but what are the immediate consequences of this? I should say the right-hand side is going to be a little bit of a shorthand for the metabolic pathways as we've introduced them in this class. TCA cycle down at the bottom, glycolysis going down the pipe here, gluconeogenesis occurring in the liver, okay, build, building on the way back, and then this um, alternative path here to triglyceride synthesis and breakdown involving uh, glycerol through glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and acetyl-CoA down here at the entry point into the TCA cycle. The first thing that will happen if there's caloric depredation is that blood glucose levels will start to drop. We all know this feeling. This is what happens when we get hungry. Right? Oh, my blood glucose levels are low. Right? Right? What the signals that are coming from, from your body and the, the driving force to maintain that, glu that um, those circulating glucose levels or is it coming from your brain? Your brain is a very glycolytic organ, kind of important for it to stay metabolically happy. Um, and this creates a driving force for many of the other hormonal changes that will uh, occur as a result of caloric deprivation. One of the first consequences will be to mobilize um, other sources of nutrients elsewhere or in the body if they're available. I said this once in passing, and I'll, I'll say it again now. Recall that for uh, if the, the first response is going to be try to maintain circulating blood glucose levels in some way, if it's possible, the body will need to mobilize glucose by an alternative means if it's not getting it from the diet. So the fastest and most responsive way for this to occur is through gluconeogenesis, in the liver, and all these things that we talked about before. And one of those irreversible steps of glycolysis that can't simply be run in, the re in reverse through gluconeogenesis is down at the very bottom end of glycolysis, phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate, 
That step is irreversible. That last substrate level of phosphorylation can't run that backwards. But what it can go is through this side route involving oxaloacetate. And this is what happens when glucosinogenesis needs to get uh, kicked into gear. The cell's body starts drawing from oxaloacetate stores to be able to maintain blood glucose levels. The secondary consequence of that, however, is that that oxaloacetate is also doubly required for the TCA cycle. So as the body um, steals oxaloacetate from the TCA cycle for gluconeogenesis, you've now depleted the TCA cycle from tricarboxylic acids to be able to run, this, to run the cycle. The consequence of the oxaloacetate depletion here, so now TCA cycle is not working, you will also break down fats during this co caloric depredation process. But what happens is, is that there's no place for the um, acetyl-CoA to go after the fats have been broken down because the oxaloacetate is being depleted to maintain glucose stores. So this is revving up here. This is getting broken down here, but now there's an accumulation of acetyl-CoA that needs to be handled by some other mechanism other than the TCA cycle. These get further metabolized through an alternative pathway, which was this alternative path that was shown in one of the earlier slides from last time, into metabolites called ketones or ketone bodies. To remind a little bit of organic chemistry, ketones are two carbon groups brought together by a carbonyl, carbon double bond, such as shown here. And these ketone bodies, um, in fact, can be metabolized by metabolically active tissues like the brain and like the heart as an alternative energy source. These are also um, the types of compounds, because they're ketones, they're fragrant, we can smell them. You can smell the, these on a person um, if they are um, in a state of ketosis, because they're, they're volatile compounds that will evolve off of smell it on a person's breath. And they've alluded to this to diabetics who are under, in a cellular starvation state. They're forming these keto, ketone bodies, some of which are keto acids. If people have heard of ketoacidosis, it's a re, the result of building up high levels of the ketones in, in the body and as a marker of the cellular starvation uh, response. And so there's a pretty profound shift in metabolic handling that occurs when you start mobilizing these ketone bodies. And it's by this metabolic rewiring that's taking place inside the cell. The final consequence of this, which gets uh, to where um, amino acid metabolism feeds into the metabolic pathways that we've, we've introduced, um, recall that um, amino acids such as aspartate are uh, one quick transamination or isomerization away from becoming something in the TCA cycle, such as oxaloacetate. Uh, and this is then accompanies breakdown, not just of fats, but muscle. Any of your bigger muscles, they have a lot of protein in them. Those can get broken down into their uh, amino acid subunits, and then they get into to try to maintain the TCA cycle as well. So you will get fat metabolism, but over a prolonged period of time, it's also going to uh, be associated with a ketoacidotic state and muscle wasting to be able to maintain the glucose levels at a high enough level or ketone levels at a high enough level to allow important organs such as your heart and your brain to stay alive. The consequences of the, the, the complete cellular starvation response, part of the motivation for a diet, I don't know, from maybe 20 years ago called the Atkins diet, if you've ever heard of this, where it is eliminating carbohydrates from the diet and then supplementing with protein only. And the rationale for this is to elicit the same type of um, starvation type of response along glucose gluconeogenesis, but then rather than having your muscles get wasted away to provide oxaloacetate, supplement with a protein-rich diet that gives the amino acids that needed to feed in and maintain the TCA 
cycle. Our cartoon on the right then is trying to establish this metabolic state where nutrients are coming in here rather than in here on the top in the form of uh, carbohydrates or from fats over on the right hand side to promote breakdown of fats, glycerol backbone through glycolysis, the fatty acids through beta oxidation, and then the TCA cycle can still work because you're maintaining the um, three car uh, the uh, tricarboxylic acid pool through the protein diet. And so this can work as long as you don't change things. You have to commit to something like this for <laughs> forever. Um, if you go back to what you're usually doing, all this goes right back to the way it once was. For, for all of these, the only thing that's going to change these in the long term are permanent changes. Carbon sources coming in means you know, if that's more than energy utilization, right, that's going to get stored in some way. You can change that a bit with exercise. This creates mobilization to break down fast through lip lipolysis. And those will have positive impacts on your respiratory capacity and the mitochondria, which then relates to how effectively you're breaking down some of those fat break breakdown pro products. And so your mitochondria can work differently in different metabolic states. If your tissues are uh, more metabolically active, those will help with fat metabolism. And then the final part, which is where we're going to transition over into to alcohol. We're going to talk about how alcohol metabolism feeds directly into some of these pathways and creates a shortcut for fat storage. Oh, and right, I have to tell this in the form of an anecdote. Because as we get to the end of the semester, I start telling funny stories about myself. Uh, and so when I started teaching these, these lectures, um, I'm not a metabolism person, so I have to give these some type of real world um, uh, evidence for me to keep my engagement into the material. So when I was first uh, teaching it, I was doing my usual thing. I have two daughters. When they, at this time, they were pretty young. And um, my, my daughter's like, oh, can I have one of these vitamin waters for my lunch? And I was like, no way. Those things are full of sugar. You don't want to have one of those things. And then she was old enough at the time to fire back. And she's like, well, why do you have one at lunch? You have a good point, and I know I have to teach these lectures, so let's do an experiment, because I know how much one of those vitamin waters is. 125 calories per bottle. I was like, let's do a dietary intervention. So I'm going to go we'll measure me a couple of times. I bounce up and down, bounce up and down on the scale in the morning. And then I'm going to stop with 125 calories every day, and let's see if that moves the needle on my weight. And so she recorded all the numbers for me, I guess. And well, maybe uh, it, it's kind of hard to hard to hard to see. Maybe it drifts a little bit, right? But there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of back and forth. And then I recognized, and the reason why I put this on the slide, I had two weddings <laughs> that messed up here. And so I apparently like the open bar better than the dance floor because you can see that kind of offset all the things that I did with my vitamin water. All right, why might that be? The met metabolic pathways for alcohol metabolism are identical to the processes of fermentation, but run in reverse. Okay, so the way that yeast can make ethanol or champagne and for beer, we have a couple of the enzymes to take them back, and that's how we metabolize them. What occurs? Well, if we ingest ethanol, it is small enough and permeable enough to go all the way through our bodies. It its metabolic byproduct is to be oxidized into this intermediate called acid aldehyde. Now, I have this note here. This threw me for a second. It, the enzyme that promotes that oxidation is alcohol dehydrogenase. It is a dehydrogenase, and it's catalyzing an oxidation reaction. What I mean by running it in reverse is that this is not the normal way metabolically, for example, that yeast would use that enzyme. They would take these intermediates to make ethanol right, and, and consume a reducing equivalent in the process. In us, we have alcohol dehydrogenase, and so this is how we're, we're running it when ethanol is in abundance. Secondarily, to get back into metabolic pathways that we're aware of, we have to be able to handle the acid aldehyde intermediate. 
and convert it into something that can be met metabolized by the core metabolic pathways. And that involves another dehydrogenation reaction and oxidation of acid aldehyde to acetyl CoA. So now we're back into core metabolism. Again. But remember, acetyl CoA is the breakdown product of beta oxidation from fat. So if there's a lot of ethanol into the system, a couple of dehydrogenation reactions later, now you have a lot of building blocks for fat synthesis, you know, driving fatty acid synthesis um, as a result of this consumption. Other thing, let's see. I see there's a few Asians in the audience. My wife is Asian, she's Shanghainese, and can't drink, can't hold her alcohol. And what does that mean? She gets no enjoyment out of it, and she gets really sick if she does. Um, and this is a direct result of that intermediate acid aldehyde. Acid aldehyde, we do not normally make. The only reason that it would arise is by this pathway involving eth ethanol. And the problem associated with it is this aldehyde group. Aldehydes are chemically reactive. Those chemical reactions can disrupt the um, electron transport chain in the mitochondria, giving rise to free radicals. As a result of this free radical generation, more to come on that, this ties into oxidative stress that can interfere with um, different pathways, which we'll speak more about antioxidants and detoxifying enzymes that would reverse the effect of those uh, free radicals get depleted. And because of the chemical reactivity of the aldehyde, these can form covalent products on proteins, amino acids, lipids, so-called addicts, so chemical, foreign chemical groups on biomolecules. And these can create immune responses, new antigens, neoantigens on certain proteins if it gets uh, bad, bad enough. Um, and if this is somebody who's a chronic drinker, um, if this is occurring over a long period of time in the support cells uh, in the liver, so-called stellate cells, as a result of all of this mitochondrial st stress and metabolic stress, this triggers the secretion of extracellular matrix protein collagen in the liver. And this ties into um, the accumulation of fat and hepatocytes also in the, the immune cells. And so this ECM secretion, this fattening and dying of cells in the liver, this will lead to cir uh, cirrhosis, hardening of the liver, associated with alcoholics, okay? Um, and it's a result of the acid aldehyde byproducts from chronic overconsumption of alcohol. All right, I gotta get back to my wife now. All right, I get into that. That unpleasant feeling if you drink too much, the hangover the day after, all right, that's inflammation related to this guy in the middle, all right? That metabolic by byproduct, acid aldehyde. In the Asian population, there's variations of these two enzymes. One that is deficient in this acid aldehyde dehydrogenase activity, meaning this pathway doesn't work as well as it ordinarily should. And then another allele in the uh, East Asian population that is hyperactive for processing alcohol into acid aldehyde. So I've not genotyped my wife, but I'm pretty sure she has both of these alleles because she basically has one sip, turns red, flushing, immediately goes to the acid aldehyde. And if she has two sips, she's done like, in the bathroom. All right. So that's on the caloric consumption. I have one more uh, addition on things. Again, I teach this five or six times. So like I have to wrink, change in another wrinkle. So my vitamin water diet didn't move the needle at all with my weight because I have other activities and things like that. So I said, let's try something a little bit more uh, aggressive that ties into some elements of starvation but not doing the same thing all the time. And so this involves the intermittent fasting diet. More and more people seem to be hearing about this. When I first talked about it, people thought it was bizarre. Um, here's the rationale for this. It's called 5-2. And what that means is you eat whatever you want on five days of the week. Um, but two, you drop your caloric intake down a third to a third of what you ordinarily eat. So hardly anything. 
small rations. Why? The rationale for this, we talked about the liver, important um, organ for gluco circulating glucose levels, gluconeogenesis. I also mentioned when we we're talking about uh, glycogen storage is an important place for glycogen stores in the liver. So when you don't eat, one of the first things that gets mobilized before gluconeogenesis kicks in is the mobilization of glycogen stores. And depending upon how much you've eaten before you start doing this, that usually takes place at 12 to 16 hours of no eating. So that's going to, after that, you have gluconeogenesis to the extent possible, and then you're going to have the breakdown of fats and that oxaloacetate depletion. That's exactly the same as the um, um, starvation diet that I talked about before. But you don't do it forever. You do it long enough that you go into a state of mild ketosis, so like a gentler, calmer level of those things. And then at the end of that day, you can go back to eating. And, and what ends up happening is those nutrient sources basically replenish everything that you had depleted before. So you kind of empty the tank all in all uh, at different points along the metabolic pathways, just enough to try to get as much as you can out from here. And then you replenish with whatever you want to eat after that. I said, this sounds kind of crazy. So I tried. All right, here was my vitamin water range. This is where I started. So you do this two days a week, and then the other day, five days, you do it whatever you want. Um, so mine are Mondays and Wednesdays. So if I seem a little cranky on Monday office hours, this is why. So 600 calories, and then keep going there. And then you just kind of bounce back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that sort of worked. My new wrinkle this year is I bought a ketone meter. That mild state of ketoacidosis, I mentioned you have this fragrant compound that gets evolved uh, when you go into this state. And you can actually use this for redox chemistry in these little devices. It's basically like a mini breathalyzer. We talked about um, one of the things that can get evolved, the byproduct of one of these, ket uh, these ketones, is acetone. You know, it's from chemistry class, things like that. Well, the acetone, if you breathe it over a fuel cell, which is what's inside this, you can, you can oxidize the uh, acetone associated with a reduction in oxygen over a metal fuel cell that's in here. Gains of electrons, losses of electrons. There's just enough current that goes through that metal catalyst that's in the device here that you can measure it and uh, calibrate it to how much of the substrate that you had breathe them. So I'm going to see how I'm doing. This takes 20 seconds to purge itself. If any of you, usually if you take this, it will read zero. But you're not starving yourself. I should have pressed this before. Okay, so 3.45 millimolar estimated in the blood, which is a, a ketotic state. Because I've, I've eaten some, but I haven't totally offset. So I did some data collection here. So here's the last, I did a couple of weeks here. And so here are those fluctuations in weight that I talked about before, and that you'll see the ketotic state once it goes away, then I put on the pounds, then I stop eating, then these go up, around, out in phase, out in phase. So pretty good anti-correlation. What it's doing is I'm shifting back and forth between that depleted thing, replenish the stores, go back to normal, up and down, up and down I go. Changes up the week a little bit. All right. We made a brief allusion to um, the impact of alcohol on the mitochondria, this oxidative stress free radicals. I want to speak a little bit more um, about this generally in terms of what's called oxidative stress. And this involves a redox chemistry. It involves the back and forth between oxidation pathways, reduction pathways, and the potential escape of electrons 
that are getting transferred back and forth between coenzymes, substrates, products, and metabolic pathways that we talked about. When those electrons escape from one of those redox pathways, one place where they're apt to go is oxygen or under aerobic conditions. And when that free electron goes on to oxygen, it will generate what's called a reactive oxygen species, or ROS for short, called superoxide. So oxygen plus one free electron, one negative. And superoxide very quickly uh, in aqueous solutions can become peroxide, pick up another electron as follows. And both of those comprise reactive oxygen stress, reactive, uh, comprise a reactive oxygen species inside the cell. There are other reactive species involving free radicals, namely those involving nitrogen. Go all the way back to Professor Barker's lecture on second messenger signaling, guanamide cyclase, protein kinase G, these things. Nitric oxide is an intermediate. It's a free radical also. It is an unpaired electron. It can um, uh, perform chemistry inside the cells, and it can also perform uh, react with reactive oxygen species to form super reactive uh, nitrogen species called peroxynitrate. So all of these free radical products have the potential to do the chemistries that I'll touch on in the next couple of slides. For Ross, the upshot is that the major source of reactive oxygen species in the cells occurring all the time is through the electron transport chain, through aerobic metabolism involving complexes one, two, three, four. I'm showing this slide again because I'm going to reframe it in a different way. When I talked about this, when we were discussing electron transport, it's described as like this great handoff electron goes to the next uh, iron sulfur cluster and then it gets passed off to the next com uh, complex in the respiratory chain. And that's true for the most part, but in reality, they, it's not 100% efficient at the transfer of, uh, of those electrons. Electrons can leak out of the electron transport chain and then give rise to this reactive oxygen species. We're reminding that oxygen is right in the vicinity here is the terminal electron acceptor of aerobic uh, uh, respiration. We're going to speak just briefly about the major place where a leak occurs of electrons, and it's at the first handoff from NADH to complex one. When I talked about complex one, I mentioned that the first electron acceptor was a coenzyme called flavin mononucleotide, or FMN. Here's what it looks like. It ordinarily will pick up the two electrons from NADH and go into its reduced form, as shown here. But occasionally, one of those electrons falls off and then is out free to react with oxygen and to form a reactive oxygen species. There are also certain circumstances of metabolic states that may uh, promote the leakiness of the handoff to, to complex one and give rise to more reactive oxygen species inside cells. And for completeness, the same thing can happen with the, the next handoff to complex three. So what happens with, with superoxide? Why do we consider it a stress? Um, what are the different things that it can do? The free radical, the free electron, is highly chemically reactive. One example that it could, uh, that, uh, of what it can do is immediately modify the side groups of multiple amino acids. Here's one example for, for arginine we have what's called a carbonylation. The oxygen here will attack at the carbon here and release this entire nitrogen group and create this carbonylated product at the end. I will note that this carb carbonylated product on the end here has another free, is another free aldehyde. So that's, again, reactive, which can cross-link to different amines and do other types of chemistry. And so there's a lot of uh, this propagating chemical reactions that occur as a result of free radicals. One place in particular where that cascading reactions can be bad are in lipids. Recall when you did cell membranes, 
Professor Barker, you know, um, unsaturated and saturated fatty acids. The unsaturated fatty acids that have the double bonds. If an electron comes in and breaks apart that uh, double bond, it generates yet another free radical that can propagate through the membrane. And so it does chemistry, generates another reactive species that can go in and uh, do another chemical modification nearby. And then the last thing to say about reactive oxygen species is that these can cause DNA damage. And that these uh, free radicals will modify covalently bases in DNA. They are repaired by the nucleotide excision repair machinery that we talked about in a couple of other settings. The complexity with Ross-induced DNA damage is that it's a, not a nice, clean uh, modification like alkylation, if you will, or thymine dimers with, with UV. It elicits a whole array of different um, base pair damages, so it needs to have a lot more different types of recognition and repair machineries to offset all of the different uh, lesions that are caused by it. This would seem to be very bad for the cell, right? How would anything operate in the face of this chronic generation of reactive oxygen species in cells? We've been intimately tied to aerobic metabolism for a long time. And as a result of that close connection separation and eukaryotic life in general, we have co-evolved a rather elaborate um, detoxifying uh, set of pathways and machinery, enzymatic machinery, to handle reactive oxygen species when they're being produced in the cells. Most broadly, they fall into this category of what are called scavenging enzymes, which catalyze reactions that uh, provide sacrificial substrates that can be modified with the reactive oxygen species as they're generated. And so those sacrificial substrates pick one for the team, so to speak. Rather, you'd rather have one of those be damaged or one of those be oxidized rather than a base of your DNA or a key protein on the uh, membrane surface. And one of the major um, sacrificial biomolecules is called glutathione, or GSH for short. And where the SH comes in relates to a free thiol in the glutathione molecule that acts as an electron acceptor um, uh, during these, sca these scavenging processes. So acting as an antioxidant. So let's just walk through the, the, the path here. If we have oxygen, free electron escape, let's say, from flavin mononucleotide. Now we have superoxide in water. These can also give rise to hydrogen peroxide. One of the first set of scavenging enzymes is to actually promote the formation of hydrogen peroxide as a somewhat less reactive, reactive oxygen species. And that's catalyzed by an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, or SOD. Um, what these are seeking to do is create hydrogen peroxide, which can be handled by another enzyme called the catalase, to generate oxygen and water. The other way in which these hydrogen peroxides can be handled is with the glu glutathione machinery where instead of going and making water and oxygen, two free glutathiones here, this is what glutathione looks like, here is the free sulfahydryl group, the free thiol group, that gets oxidized to form a disulfide bond, also generating water. And so depending upon um, the localization of the reactive oxygen species and the relative abundance of these scavenging enzymes, you can fat favor this process uh, or this process. It's also critically dependent upon overall glutathione levels in cells, how useful that is in the substrate. Um, as I was mentioning for the alcohol consumption, if you have too many free radicals, you can deplete glutathione levels, preventing this pathway from happening, and then you're relying on this one. The handling of oxidative stress and the study of oxidative stress, heaven forbid we should ever give an opinion paper on oxidative stress. It, it's, it's a real um, disaster to study. Uh, and the reason why is because of the reactivity of the molecule, 
and also its ubiquity. It's always being generated inside the cell. It has real pleiotropic effects on a number of different biomolecules. I already mentioned the secondary consequences of what happens when it's synthesized. And then you're always, the cell is always having these scavenging processes trying to offset the oxidative stress as it's being produced. And it goes on and on and on down the pathway. There are a lot of other complications from a scientific perspective to be able to study it in a rigorous way. The localization of the reactive oxygen species matters if it's right at the mitochondria or is it reactive oxygen species can be generated at the plasma membrane. These can mean different things. They're short-lived species, and so the range of action that they operate on, those carbonylation processes or peroxidation processes happen locally as soon as they're produced. There's a bunch of other complications to try to study them, so it's challenging. This closes metabolism. I'll highlight two investigators uh, here at UVA. Thurls are lipid uh, signaling guy interested in insulin handling. We heard about insulin in an earlier lecture in, uh, in the Department of Pharmacology. And then Zen um, in the cardiovascular research center, very interested in muscle metabolism, mitochondria, the effect of exercise, and so forth. So you can look them up. Do you have any questions on metabolism before I transition over to cell cycle? If not, deep breath, last hurrah. We're doing cancer, we're doing cell cycle, cell proliferation. This is the final, the beginning of what will be the final lecture going in to uh, class tomorrow. <laughs> we had a pre-lecture for today's class on mitosis and cytokinesis, the actual act of cell division. The main lecture is going to focus on the regulation of this uh, cell cycle progression, getting into mitosis, relating that to extracellular stimuli that are initiated with a family of receptors on the plasma membrane surface called tyrosine kinases. And all of this we're going to package in the setting of uh, cancer and specifically cervical cancer because we can tie it in very directly with some deregulation in the cell cycle machinery. Cancer is a big problem. A lot of people die from cancer. It costs a lot of money, and it will continue to increase. Uh, it has bypassed cardiovascular disease as the leading killer in the United States. And you see the total expenditures costs here. Now, most cancers do not arise from transmissible viral infections. We are going to talk about one of the outliers, one case of a cancer that is clearly promoted by a virus. And that virus is called human papillomavirus, or HPV for short. The HPV, HPV family um, has many different strains associated with it. Collectively, they are known to promote uh, different lesions, either benign lesions or malignant lesions on skin or epithelial surfaces. And we'll talk more about what benign and malignant mean uh, in a moment. We're talking about them today because of the connection between one strain or a couple of strains of HPV and cervical cancer. More to come on that. I also want to say that the HPV association is not just with cancers of the, the cervix, but also with certain strains of head and neck cancers. So in the oral cavity, these are the, ordinarily the types of uh, cancers that arise from smokers, especially people that smoke and drink. It's really bad for head and neck cancer. But there's also a viral subtype of head and neck cancer that is promoted by HPV infection. The benign lesions caused by some of the strains of HPV are epithelial skin hyperproliferations they're just not cancer, they're a wart. On the skin, different places on, on the skin. These are not precursors to cancer, but they are an indication of deregulated cell cycle control. 
and overproliferation in those cells at the site where the infection occurred. If we talk about the prevalence of human papillomavirus infection, it's like freak you out high, okay? Very, very high. About 20, you see 25, 30% of women. You see when the prevalence peaks. Everybody is very active, okay? And so if you accumulate that over a lifetime, the incidence, the chances of people uh, getting an HPV infection is really, really high. And I talk about women. I pulled this paper out uh, for that oral HPV infection. The prevalence is higher for men than for women. Yeah. Now, the, the final, final thing, if I can unfreak you out a little bit, is that the, the linkage between HPV and these different cancer types is not a direct one-to-one -one match. What is um, true is that cancers that arise from those different subtypes will be overrepresented with HPV infections. So it's sort of a necessary but not sufficient, especially for cervical cancer. And as I mentioned, for head and neck, uh, this can occur by smoking and, and drinking. There are other paths to that cancer. So for cancer of the cervix, here are the incidences. It are, it's relatively rare, but again, for cervical cancer, it's almost completely preventable if one could avoid these HPV infections because it's almost a one-to-one -one mapping of the cancers that arise are associated with different strains of HPV. One of the reasons why the... Um, uh, Right, okay, so you see the statistics, the mortalities if you're mapping this is about, tw uh, let's see, what is that? 25, 30% mortality associated with it. The reason is, is that it's ordinarily difficult to diagnose if women are not getting routine screenings, things like pap smear, cervical imaging, one clinical image to show you what they're looking for on those images, this margin here, this is the hyperproliferation of the cervical carcinoma cells along, uh, along the cervix. But otherwise, there's no symptoms from the women until often it's far too, too late, which is the reason why routine screening is heavily, heavily advocated for. Okay, so we are going to get back to HPV, cervical cancer, at the end of class next time after we've given you all the fundamentals of cell cycle control and cell cycle uh, checkpoints and how they relate to the genome of the human papillomavirus. But before we get there, I have to give you a Cliff Notes version of the abundant vocabulary associated with cancer biology because there is a lot of it. You'll note that these terms are blue, uh, so please know them. And it's, again, the goal is to get you at least in some way conversant on the, the terminology associated with cancer biology. Let's begin with benign and malignant. I talked about those in the setting of warts versus cervical cancer. A benign lesion, you wouldn't even, uh, cancer biologists and oncologists have stopped even calling these cancers anymore. They're not cancers. We'll call them lesions. They will be, sometimes they can be precursors, sometimes they can just sit there forever. A mole, we talked about nevi before, that's a benign lesion. Hyperproliferates for a while, senesces, and then sits there, it's fine. This is different from malignancy, which is a cell that has been disrupted genetically um, and now is going beyond the initial site where the, the lesion started. And there are three characteristics of malignant tumors, which we call anaplasia, invasion, metastasis, and each one of those have their own terms associated with them. First thing is anaplasia. 90% of all cancers arise from epithelial tissues, and they give rise to what are so-called carcinomas, which are epithelial tumors. Epithelial cells, as you know, and we did a lecture on epithelial cells, polarize cell-cell junctions, apical side, basolateral side, very tight arrangement organization. That's a differentiated cell morphology. It's a specialized function, transcytosis, uptake of nutrients. It depends upon what epithelial barrier you're talking about. When epithelial cells lose those characteristics, cervical epithelial, lose those characteristics, they lose the differentiation state that characterizes their normal, uh, normal properties and normal function. That's anaplasia. Uh, 
if the cells migrate away from the part of the tissue of the organ where they ordinarily reside, that's called invasion. Oftentimes, or many times with epithelia, there are ECM boundaries that demarcate where those epithelial cells are supposed to be, where they're not supposed to be. When those rules break down, then it's the, uh, defined as invasion. An invasion re refers to the local dissemination of those malignant cells within the tissue or organ in which they arose. Metastasis is another form of movement, but a movement now to more distant locations in the body. Other organs, a breast cancer going to the lung or to the bone, a melanoma going to the brain, those are, that's an example of metastasis. And depending upon the cancer type, the chronology of the cells as they pick up DNA mutations, they pick up these different genetic insults, and then they pick up these characteristics of anaplasia, invasion, and metastasis. That whole chronology is called tumorigenesis or oncogenesis. So, and it's referring to from initiation to the progression to malignancy, all of the steps along the way. So let's show a before and after. This is not from the same patient, but I want to give you some context. And now we've seen cells before, let's show some real, real cell images instead of cartoons. This is a cross-section of normal breast tissue. The normal breast is comprised of ducts and lobules, these grape-like clusters of epithelial cells where milk secretion occurs. Milk goes out the, through the ducts out, out the nipple. These are different lobules, those grape-like sacs here, the milk secreting units, and this is an example of a duct. Okay. The breast epithelium usually has two layers of epithelial cells. They're a little hard to see in this image, but the ones lit up in brown here, that's the, um, the first layer of epithelium all next to one another, all along the sides of both the ducts and the lobules. Same stain. This is what a breast cancer can, can look like. Abundant, this is no cells, this is ECM. All right, so this is just a, is, is, um, hyper secretion of different extracellular matrix uh, proteins. These are necrotic cells just floating around in the empty space. Here are the cancer cells. You'll notice that they have a much larger nucleus. Um, no organization. And here's an invasive finger. You can see the front here where the cells are coming out from the primary tumor and invading into the extracellular matrix out, outside. All right, so those are all the early steps that define malignancy. There are additional processes that become required for when a solid tumor grows beyond a certain size. Maybe you have or will learn this in physiology. Oxygen can't diffuse passively more than a millimeter. And so when you have a tumor that grows beyond a millimeter size, either it will start dying in the center, forming a necrotic core. Some of that might have been what was in that image uh, from before, because they get starved from oxygen. Can't undergo aerobic respiration, all that other stuff. Okay, and they die unless they're able to mobilize new blood vessels to vascularize the tumor as it grows. And there are certain tumors that are very effective at doing it. This process of recruiting new blood vessels to promote the continued growth of a solid tumor um, is called angiogenesis. All right, we have a couple of things here I wanna say a bit about. We're talking about oncogenesis and, 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 and things. Um, oncotumorigenesis, th those chronologies. Oncogenic or tumorigenic adjective, simply meaning does it cause cancer. We have two or three categories of genes here to be aware of. And some of these bear directly on the opinion paper that you have this, this semester. All right, so oncogene is a little bit of a, all of these are somewhat fraught terms, but I'll give you the most concise definition that I'm satisfied with. An oncogene is any gene whose product of that gene causes cancer. What does that mean? It, that means it would have to be seen in the wild, meaning that there will have to be a cancer in a 
person, ideally, um, where that gene has been disrupted and is causative for that, for the tumorigenesis of that cancer case. Oncogenes don't normally reside in us. They're a result of some type of mutation. However, usually what ends up uh, where those oncogenes come from is by a mutated version of a normal version of a gene that pro uh, provides some other type of regulatory function, cellular function, molecular function in the cells. That non-mutated gene is called a proto-oncogene. It's the normal version that will not cause cancer. It's more tightly controlled. It has negative feedbacks on it. It has other types of regulatory mechanisms to keep things in, in check. But if it's mutated in just the right way or just the wrong way, depending on your perspective, it can drive cancer. It can be oncogenic. There are reciprocal genes that are often broken by mutation, disrupted, not, not turned on all the time, as in the case with an oncogene, but just shut off entirely, that ordinarily would regulate processes associated with inhibiting cancer. It gets mutated, gets disrupted, and now the brakes are off the cells, and this can promote tumor genesis as well. Those genes are called tumor suppressors. So the designation of oncogenes and tumor suppressors is a functional classification of genes to say that they're, if they're messed up, they can be reflected in uh, certain tumors of a certain type. It doesn't speak to the function of the gene normally. It simply says that the function that the gene normally regulates, if it's misregulated, can promote or inhibit cancer. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment why. Oops. Last thing, which I was going to get us to these inputs into cell cycle control, are a category of peptide hormones circulating in our bloodstreams and residing locally in tissues called growth factors. They're proteins or peptides, and they're going to bind to receptors on the plasma membrane surface of cell types and promote um, the growth and proliferation of cells, promote the entry of cells into the cell cycle to cause them to uh, undergo mitosis and cytokinesis. So I think about those as the early trigger of these proliferation promoting stimuli under normal regulation. Different human cancers have different ages of onset, and the incidence of each one of those cancer types depends in, uh, with, uh, they will always increase as a function of age, but the rate at which they increase and the rate at which they become uh, de detectable as, as tumors depends wildly on the type of tissue or the type of tumor that we're talking about. A couple of examples are, are shown here. There are two take homes from, uh, from this slide. One is that the slopes there, this is on a logarithmic plot on the left-hand side. So the line means exponential growth. So as time progresses, as random mutations accumulate in every one of our tissues and organs over time as a result of errors because of cell proliferation, DNA damage because of reactive oxygen species, environmental insults, other things like I talked about cause DNA damage. They, once they uh, accumulate in our body and they become into our, the genome of the cells that had those DNA uh, insults, they they're permanently reside in, in those cells. So this accumulates, 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 and at some point, different cells in different tissues will have enough hits to their genome that it cause enough genetic insults to give rise to, to cancer. However, if you also look at this cartoon and we drop, and let's just declare 30 to be the evolutionarily constrained re reproductive age limit, meaning every, everything you, you live after 30 is bonus from evo evolution's standpoint, you'll, it's true, right? I mean, what, what else are you here for? Um, note that almost none of the cancers arise before we're 30. So this is the reason why a gene function of an 
a tumor suppressor or an, a proto-oncogene or an oncogene can't re be reconciled with evolutionary time because there's no selection for these things. Re by the time that those cancers have arisen, the role of that gene or that protein has already served its role. There's no evolutionary selection. The one example, note's the one example, skin. Right? And depending on people's origins, ethnicities, this is where we see differences in pigmentation depending on geography. Right? We have different uh, susceptibilities to, to skin cancer because it can be early onset because it's a chronic source of DNA damage to our um, epidermis. So think about that. We have two days. Right? All right. All right, let's, let, me, let me not have it cause you despair. Many genes that have a tumor suppressive or a proto-oncogenic role are involved in cell cycle control, cell proliferation more generally. And so this is how they can have an associated tumor suppressive or proto-oncogenic oncogenic role. But really what they're doing in, the cell, in all of those decades before cancer build, builds up is some regulation mechanistically on control of the cell cycle. And many of the places where uh, different proteins, proto-oncogenes, tumor pressures can Im impinge on the cell cycle are in pathways that you've already heard. Growth factors I just introduced only in a namesake, more to come on that, along with their cognate receptors. Intracellular signal transduction. Recall that I was going to come back to the RAS map kinase pathway from before. This is a key proliferation and cell cycle regulatory pathway. It's right in the in the intermediate of the signaling pathways that we're going to talk about. Why do they control cell cycle progression? The reason is that at, at the end of that, we have phosphorylation and activation of certain transcription factors that change genes that are involved in cell cycle progression. But they also can be involved in other types of pathways. For example, the prevention of apoptosis. So you can either proliferate a lot or you can stop dying. So there are certain examples where, or, uh, rather than uh, revving up proliferation, you're dampening down death. And the final place, which ties on to both the control of the cell cycle, as well as the notion of tumor suppression and oncogenesis, is on uh, DNA repair proteins and the checkpoints in the cell cycle that they are able to activate if DNA damage occurs. So the gist of this is that if they're in certain stages of this, the cell cycle, if DNA damage by reactive oxygen species, by environmental insults, by stalled replication forks, all those things we were talking about before, if that's not going well from the cell, the cell can stop replicating or stop progressing through the cell cycle to allow that damage to be repaired before progressing. Gave this slide in the pre-lecture just as, a, as an entry point into the, the different phases of the cell cycle. We have the two main categorizations are the M phase, comprised of mitosis and cytokinesis. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus. Cytokinesis is the division of the rest of the cell. Telophase, actin cables, compression, cell division. Outside of M is called interphase, which is basically everything else. And interphase has a couple of different subheadings within it. So if the cell has just mitosed and cytokinesed, we have a new daughter cell here. To be able to go around the bend and divide once again, it needs to synthesize its DNA. So somewhere in the middle here, there's a synthesis phase, S phase, which is where DNA replication occurs, exactly in the way that we talked about when we did DNA replication. But flanking either side of S phase are two what they call gaps, which simply means they didn't know what was going on, so they called them gaps. First gap is G1 before S, and then the, the gap between S and uh, M is called G2. Things are happening, and we're going to talk about some of the things that are occurring during uh, those, those gap phases. This is also where several of these checks are um, put on the cell cycle to evaluate whether the cell is ready to move on to the next phase of the cell cycle. So they're critically important 
don't get the impression that nothing is happening during those gap phases. And then finally, there are certain examples, many in fact, where the cells are not chronically cycling. Where are the places where we have chronically cycling cells? Hair follicles, our gut epithelium, our hematopoietic system is turning over all the time. We have certain cells in our body that divide a handful of times in our entire lifetime. What, what are they doing all during the rest? They're not in the cell cycle at all. They're in a phase which people will call colloquially as G0. This is a permanent gap. Goes into this cul-de-sac of the cell cycle, and they can hang out there forever. This is alternatively called the quiescence, which simply refers to a resting state of the cells, non-cycling cells. Quiescence is different than one of the things that we talked about that I want to warn you about. It is not the same as senescence. You will call senescence too many divisions, telomere shortening, flattened out, fried egg appearance, and then no more growth, ever. Quiescence does have a degree of reversibility to it. Quiescence means I'm not proliferating now, but if I'm provided the right growth factors or proliferative stimuli in my environment, I may come out of that cul-de-sac and go back into the cell cycle and turn around again. So the quiescence is, is a, viewed as a reversible state. Senescence, classically irreversible. How does the cell navigate this, this cycle? There was actually a debate for quite a, uh, a while related to does the cell cycle just operate as a washing machine, meaning like once you go in, you just get run around the circle, run around the circle to get spit out on the other side? Or is there something else in, in between? Um, there, in other words, is there a precise order of things that has to occur for, it to, uh, for, for the cell to proceed? And the answer turned out to be somewhere in between, meaning that there are certain phases where once you're committed to that phase, the cell's gonna go all the way through that phase. But then at key points along the way, there are these things called checkpoints that allow the cell to stop, pause, evaluate things, and then determine readiness to be able to proceed to the next phase. And then once that decision has been made, it will run around until the next checkpoint. A Couple of examples. We're gonna talk a lot about the G1 to S transition, which is schematized here, meaning from the cell standpoint, should I start replicating the DNA? Because once you start replicating, you're gonna go all the way and replicate the whole thing. It's a big metabolic decision, right? That's a lot of nucleotides to, to synthesize. Cell has to be the right size. Okay, so the cell's gotta be big enough to be, a com be able to accommodate a doubling of its uh, genome. There needs to be enough nutrients to make the precursors for DNA synthesis to occur. And the, those growth factors in the environment indicate a, a need for that cell to proliferate more, have to occupy more space. Another cell got pushed out of the way, and now it's, it's going to grow and infill that uh, area. So that is the external input, input for cells to make that G1 to S transition. And this will be the major focus of uh, tomorrow's class, or to, uh, Thursday's class. Here I also do want to uh, talk briefly about two other ones. In the beginning, we were talking about microtubules, right, in the mitotic spindle, and having the right attachments on the sister chromatids to, to, um, to separate. This is, an, this is called the spindle checkpoint. All right, so that anaf uh, metaphase plate, and the transition to anaphase, right, when, when the, all of the chromosomes have been properly bound by two my microtubules, that's a form of a checkpoint, which we'll also talk about uh, next time. And then finally, um, at the transition from G2 into M, there's another size check, and also this is a prominent check to see how, if there is any DNA damage as a result of the cell going through that S phase. Stalled replication forks or adducts or things that need to be uh, repaired. So we will start here and then we'll finish here next time. And then where blanks that we need to fill in in next class relate to connecting how growth factors, protein hormones from outside the cell, when presented to a cell, to get transduced intracellularly to give rise to the replication of DNA, the onset of S phase, and then ultimately to mitosis during M phase.
questions in the final five minutes. Okay, Thursday, last day. See you then.